Oh, Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to our panel discussion. Uh, I am Renee Kerrigan from the Peoria Riverfront Museum and our Dome Planetarium. And I have a lovely panel here with me yeah. today. We are. Um, do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Hi. I'm Jason Heaton from the Boonchalk Museum in Dayton, Ohio. That's it. That's, that's, <laughs> that's correct. No, most of the information, most of that okay. is correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you were introducing yours. I have one over here. But um, I'm Sarah Schultz uh, from the Minnesota State University Moorhead Planetarium. I think you probably Hi. better just use yours. I'm Dave DeRemer uh, from the Waukesha Schools Planetarium, Waukesha, Wisconsin. And uh, we're all here today to talk about how to make money with your planetarium. Who needs to make money in your planetarium? <laughs> like, everybody needs to make money, right? I mean, we, are, we exist to teach and to help people learn about astronomy and science, but we all have to make money uh, to make budget because that's how we stay in business. Uh, so no matter what sort of planetarium you have, if you're in a, a museum, if you're in a school district, if you're in a university, you, all, you have to make budget. Um, and so we all are in different types of planetariums. I work at a multidisciplinary museum. My museum is a, uh, more focused towards the uh, adults. Uh, it's a history, science, and uh, art museum with a planetarium in it. Uh, Jason works at a children's museum, Sarah works at a university, and Dave works at a school district. So uh, we all have different types of planetariums with different situations, but we all do creative programming outside of just regular uh, school group visits, um, and they bring in significant revenue. Um, so we're just each going to talk for a little bit and share the types of programming that have worked at our institutions, um, and then we'll open it up for a discussion for everyone. So like I said, uh, I'm at the Peoria Riverfront Museum. And uh, we have the Dome Planetarium. It's the silliest name. It's a planetarium planetarium, but uh, <laughs> so we are. Uh, a little, just a little bit about my museum to help give you some context. Uh, Peoria is a city in central Illinois. Uh, the greater metropolitan area is 380,000 uh, people. Uh, so, you know, a mid-sized city. Um, my museum has a $4 million operating budget, but the planetarium only has about 83,000 of that. Um, there are 26 full-time staff members at the museum, only three of us who work in the planetarium uh, with a little bit of part-time help. And the museum gets about 180,000 visitors a year, but about 50,000 of those come through the dome. So uh, we do the typical types of programming, uh, public shows every single day and school group visits, but we do a lot of evening events and that's how we generate uh, our extra revenue. And one of our most successful and longest running was actually started by Sheldon Schaefer, who ran the planetarium before me, Wine and Cheese Under the Stars. And um, we conti I've continued this program and um, we actually do a little bit more than when Sheldon first started the program because it's been super popular and sells out most times that we offer it. Um, so this is an event where we have local wine. Uh, we work with local Illinois wineries, ask them to donate half of the wine. So they donate half the wine and I purchase half of the wine, um, which they, they get advertising out of it, basically, which is why it motivates them to donate the wine. Uh, cheese, and then um, planetarium programming. It's a two-hour event. We do this four to six times a year. Um, and tickets are $30 or $33 per person. Members get the discount. So here's an example of a budget from that event. Um, the wine is the biggest expense at about $200 usually for wine. We have to buy our food and supplies. By the way, we used to have these catered, but we learned that in our food license, we can prepare uh, food, we can prepare purchased food, so we can't cook it, but we can prepare purchased food. That saved us a lot of money. So the day of a wine and cheese event, I'm actually like slicing the cheese and blading the cheese. Um, it saves us a lot of money. Uh, so our expenses are pretty low, um, and I don't include staff time because I'm salaried, so my time is sort of just free. Um, and, and then you can see our revenue for just one event is about $1,000, and if you do this, um, multiple times a year, then you can bring in quite a bit of money. 
For the people who don't like wine, we do a pub night under the stars. Uh, so we have beer and usually pizza. We've also done soft pretzels and things like that. It's a very similar program. Um, we just outright purchased the beer for this, but beer is less, ex less expensive than wine. So uh, these also bring in sig significant amount of money. We do these about six times a year. Another big income generator for the museum uh, is rentals. And the planetarium is the most popular rental space in the museum uh, because we have removable seats and a flat floor. So we can take our seats out and put in tables, as you see in this picture. Um, I meant to say, by the way, we have a Zeiss CKP4 star projector and, um, a, and the Quintos full dome system in our planetarium. And it's a 40-foot dome. Um, so uh, we, to rent the planetarium, it costs $1,000 for four hours. That includes a staff person from the planetarium that gives a show. And sometimes people split that and do $500 for two hours. Uh, we do a, about once, once a month we have a rental. And then the planetarium is also included sometimes in full facility museum rentals. And this one isn't a huge income generator for the amount of staff time it requires, but it's a unique event, so I thought I'd include it. Uh, for 18 years now, we've had an interplanetary 5K. The Peoria is home to the world's largest, most complete scale model of the solar system. The planetarium is the sun. The planets are spaced out uh, in the correct distance and size. If the planetarium is the sun, again, this was all done by Sheldon Schaefer, the great Sheldon Schaefer. Uh, and so I've continued this. People can run to Mars and back in our solar system. Uh, this 5K every year in March, it nets about three to four thousand dollars, but it requires a tremendous amount of staff time to direct a 5K. So if you're just getting started, I wouldn't necessarily start by directing a 5K, but if you want help or have questions about that, I'd be happy to tell you more about that. Um, like a lot of other planetariums, uh, specifically Adler in St. Louis, um, we do yoga under the stars. Uh, and this we do about four times a year, also an evening event. We teach, uh, we split the profits 50-50 with the instructor. So that's how we um, make sure that it, if we have less attendance, we don't just take a big hit uh, in our, we don't ever lose money because we split profits after expenses with our instructor. And we do that sometimes in, on events that we're not sure how popular they will be. And then finally, um, like a lot, of, uh, a lot of other museums, we do an after dark program, which is uh, the planetarium is just a part of. So it's not really a planetarium centric event. It's really a museum event, but that we are a part of. Uh, and we just have a special exhibit open at the museum, special activities and planetarium show. Um, and then the income from these varies with each event and how, how uh, popular it is. Uh, so with all of these events, we, the planetarium as a department just brings in um, about $20,000. Um, there's other ones that, I've, that we do that I, I have, don't have time to talk specifically about. But this amount has increased significantly in the past three years. And that's because uh, the more popular the events are, the more people you are get aware of your planetarium and know that you're a fun place to come have a date night at. Um, and so we do at least one special event, probably two special events a month. Um, and these are all uh, fundraising events to help bring in money to the planetarium. And not only do they bring in money and help with our bottom line at the museum, but they just make people realize that the planetarium is a cool, fun place to be. Uh, and at every special event, we have somebody who hasn't been to the planetarium before who's coming into the museum. And so we have somebody new or reaching. And we also have people who are repeat visitors showing that you know they value us and are coming back. So that's sort of what we've been doing. I'm going to pass it off. Hey, I'm at the uh, Boonshoft Museum of Discovery in Dayton, Ohio. That's our lovely dome. You can see we're, uh, we have a special challenge different from Renee's place in that we have seats. She has no seats, which is really, really, I think, a great idea. Uh, but we do have seats. We're just putting in them right now. And I chose to cover a couple of things that we do that we've been trying out that are new. Uh, Despicable Me, you can see we do movie nights. Uh, to run a movie, you need to purchase the movie or you know rent the movie from somebody like Swank Motion Pictures, and each time you show it, you need to pay money uh, to them, so you have to cover that. Um, so you have to advertise a little bit. 
to do one of these. Jurassic Park, Frozen, those were big hits for us. We filled the theater for that. Here's an example budget of that. You just have to, uh, food and drinks being whatever you're comfortable with in your planetarium, and water, candy, whatever. Um, but you have to rent the movie. And then uh, we have 170 seats. So this is an example of what happened if we kind of filled out the theater. But that's fun. And what we do is we call it cinema science. A lot of people do this. Is there anybody here that does something similar? Yeah? Yeah, and we do something like, we do 15 minutes before the show, something related. So Frozen, I think we, oh, I don't remember what we talked about in Frozen. Despicable Me was roughly related to the moon. We did 15 to 20 minutes about the moon. We had our staff paleontologist come in and talk about Jurassic Park before we did that show. He talked about everything that was wrong with the movie <laughs> before we saw the movie. Weddings and engagements under the stars. This started because we just kept getting requests. People wanted, I'm sure everybody here has had something or heard, in a, or heard a story of somebody getting engaged or having, so we started charging for them. We started saying, uh, yeah, you can come in. And the weddings are multiple times a year and we've had more and more in the past couple of years than we've ever had before. And we think there's this sort of trend uh, for people to get married in unique places. We've had a lot of people come in as of late. And you can do all kinds of things with this. We ended up, we had so many different requests that we ended up doing uh, specific types of programs. So we do 15 minutes of uh, what the sky looked like on the day they got engaged or something that happened in the sky uh, around that time. And that one is, that one's pretty easy. It's just staff time, basically. Uh, they bring in their own stuff. Where you can say, hey, you, you want flowers? Bring in your own flowers. You want this? You have to bring it in. This one is something we're currently doing, which is naming our seats. And this was something Renee said, hey, we need somebody to cover that. And that's what we're doing right now. So we are putting in new seats into our planetarium. And we decided to do the seat naming campaign. Has anybody done this? By Yes? Did it go well for you? Did you? I just wanted to ask real quick, did you, were you able to sell all of your seats? Uh, not, not all of them. We sold uh, a, third? a third? That's great. And you? About a third? OK. Well, that gives me something, a good idea of what to expect. So we're just starting this. And you can engrave uh, your name on it. And we talked to a lot of different people, did a lot of research before we uh, started this campaign. So we found out the people are charging anywhere from $100 per seat to $5,000 per seat, depending upon where they are. And it, it wasn't like, you know, great big first run planetary. You know, it wasn't anything. Uh, sorry, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Uh, didn't matter where the planetarium was. It was just people were charging whatever. And then they, some planetariums would turn around after five years and rename the seats. Mm -hmm. So you could take, uh, take that off. So you can uh, probably pay for your seats this way, at least a portion of them. Or you can do what Renee does and not have any seats. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> Geek Fest, I, I put this in there because I really wanted, uh, I want you guys to come up and ask me about it. If you have specific questions, please ask me everything you want to know about this event. I can only give you an overview. This started from, I saw at Central Texas College when we went on a conference to WAC, to the Western Alliance Conference. And I saw that they were doing this kind of thing. And I had no idea. And I asked more and more about it. And uh, he's not in the room right now. But they were very eager to share all of the de uh, details about this event. And we decided to do it too. It was a lot of legwork to get this up and running. But it's, it's fantastic. I really have a lot of fun with this. Basically, it's a comic con for to put in, you know, for your planetarium. It's a good fit. If you just have a planetarium facility, you could find a way to make this fit. Uh, we have a larger museum, so we have uh, we have the planetarium, but we uh, use the rest of the museum too. And we have vendors, and we have uh, games. We had a video game tournament for a couple years, costume contest. Everybody gets dressed up, especially the little kids. Uh, that's a lot of fun. We have entire families dress up for this event. One family came as Kids and adults were all Avengers. It was a lot of fun. Uh, tickets are $10, so that's basically all we're doing. Oh, you can also see Jeopardy. That's one of the uh, clever things we do with our Digistar. Our person, Joe uh, Childers, on our staff created Jeopardy for the Dome. And that's a lot of fun. You have everybody pit against each other. So one side of the planetarium against the other side. And we did Geek Jeopardy. We also did a Planets of Star Wars show. Uh, all of these things together add up to one really fun event. It's only a couple of hours, but this coming year, it may expand. Central Texas College, the place that originally, it still does, Geek Fest in Texas, 
it's a weekend long event. They have celebrities come to this event. So that's hopefully, maybe we'll get to that point one day too, but for now, this will be our fourth year coming up for Geek Fest. And this is just a lot of staff time because you need to talk to your local comic book stores. You need to talk to anybody that might be interested. But after the first year, people will come to you and lots of people will come to you and want to be a part of this event. So I strongly encourage uh, anybody who has questions about this to please ask me about this. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah. Thank you. All right, so um, as I mentioned before, I'm coming from Minnesota State University, Moorhead. I'm in a university. Um, you'll notice that I have zero operating budget. I almost have like a deficit operating budget. Um, and so the money that I make has to pay for everything. Um, and so this whole idea of generating revenue in a unique way is very important for me. Um, I don't even actually, I'm not actually even full time. I'm 80% time, uh, which is better than it was before, but it could stand to be better than that. Um, we see, well I see about 10,000 visitors annually um, and we're a small um, area. I mean, we're only 130,000. Um, but we serve a lot of local areas as well, so farther out. And, um, and actually, if you'll notice, we have murals in the planetarium, and that was just done this summer, and I'm super excited about it. So those were um, artists, student artists from our campus. So, um, so the first one I want to talk about is Stars of PBS. Um, this one kind of came out of a desperation to get more people on campus and into the planetarium. And I had purchased, well actually I wrote a grant to get um, One World, One Sky. And as you know, it's, it's all about Big Bird and Elmo. And um, I thought, well what a better um, cooperation than with our local PBS station. Um, and so this is a one day event. Um, we usually do it in January because that's when people are looking for things to do with their families and it's cold outside, so they can come into the planetarium and it's nice and warm. Uh, and so we have a lot of activities. We usually use a couple buildings. I use um, a building across the street that has a lot of classrooms that we can use for uh, demonstrations and activities and things. So this is another one of those situations where it's a lot of work ahead of time, um, but we do get a lot of people. Uh, so these are some of the pictures from past years. <laughs> We have had several different characters, and we get um, groups on campus to come and help too. So we get student groups like the chemistry club or the phys physics club. Uh, some of the elementary education majors, they come out and help as well. And so it's, everybody has a good time. Actually, we had a parent crying last year because she was so excited that her daughter got to see Curious George. So <laughs> it was really cool. Um, and of course we get you know kids interacting with science. I mean. They're right in there taking a look at what's going on and they're actually involved in it. So there's a lot of benefit to it and we see probably about 400 to 500 people in one day and that's a lot of people. I, it takes a lot for me to have that many people come through the planetarium on a regular basis. So the biggest thing is really staff and we have to have a lot of people on the ground that day to help make things go smoothly because you really need it to go smoothly. I'll tell you from experience, the first year was not smooth. <laughs> I didn't expect to have 500 people show up at my door and I expected maybe 50 and I did not have the staff for it. So you'll want to make sure that you're anticipating probably larger groups than you would anticipate and make sure that you have enough people to help. Um, so total expenses can really vary uh, depending on how many students I can get to actually volunteer their time or I actually have to pay. But overall, um, generally we're seeing about $2,000 in one day, which is really big for me because uh, it takes me a lot longer to generate that kind of that mon money. Um, and really it's nice. It gives the university a really good PR opportunity. They have a lot of people coming to campus and it looks really good for the university. Uh, we started doing romance shows, so Valentine's Day shows. And I, I would say that this is the one that was the most, um, well, it was the easiest to implement and is, has made the most back. So it's super easy and people just eat that crap up. So, <laughs> and you know, we actually have scientists who are physics majors, you know, who are presenting these shows. Um, and it was really weird the first year we did it, we actually had people telling us that there wasn't enough astronomy in the show. 
And I said, well, why don't you come to the planetarium on a normal day? But, you know, I mean, it was fun. We got, most of our shows sell out. The first year I had to add shows to the schedule um, because they were all selling out and people were emailing me and calling me and asking me, can we have more shows? Mm -hmm. So you can almost just load your schedule with shows and people will come. Um, and it's cheap because I only have to pay um, my students. I usually get some little chocolates or something to give to the couples. Um, and so we sell the tickets in pairs, obviously, because you're going to want to bring somebody with you. Um, and so the chocolates are a dollar a piece, so it's not a big deal. I'm hoping to maybe um, work with some local vendors to get some chocolate donated, maybe some flowers. Uh, but I'm pretty much keeping it very low key because I really can't afford for it to be much bigger. Um, so you can make a lot if you do several of those shows. Uh, we do some gaming. It's still um, kind of maturing. Uh, I have been doing birthday parties and different um, student groups as well. And so we have the hookups to do um, different consoles and things like that. We've got Steam on our computer. We can do movie nights. And I generally charge just a little bit more for those kinds of events because they generally aren't just an hour long show. And so I have to pay my students a little bit more as well. But my average um, minimum show cost is $75. So that's the, the minimum that somebody's going to have to pay. So I usually just charge a little bit more for special events like this. OK, I'm from the School District of Waukesha, Charles Horowitz Planetarium. And uh, obviously, education is our prime focus. But as Renee was saying, we are also uh, in it uh, as a business. You have to run your planetarium. You have to impress your administrators and keep the planetarium healthy uh, economically. So uh, we do most of our programming is educational. We do uh, our own school district. We're responsible for our own curriculum, and it's important, I think, as a school system planetarium to be fully ingrained uh, in your uh, district science curriculum following, uh, we, we use next generation science standards and making sure you're, you're fully in the science curriculum of your school district and everybody respects the planetarium as a working part of that system. So there are major support, the school system itself, but we do public programs. Uh, let's see, let's go down the list here. Uh, I started with the Friends of the Planetarium as uh, a fundraiser opportunity about uh, the year 2000. And uh, they were, that was when we were a much smaller facility and they were about to cut our planetarium along with a number of other programs. And uh, we went out into the community and decided it, it was either raise uh, some money fast or or uh, fall to obscurity and, and die. And so we did, and we went, went and took uh, people from community uh, businesses, uh, people that we knew, uh, other school systems that came to the planetarium, wrote letters, and uh, we ended up getting the support we needed, and we formed this friends group. I have some handouts if anyone's interested. Every year we generate, uh, oh, three or 4,000, maybe $5,000 as just typical friends memberships for uh, to come to public shows for free, get a discount in the gift shop. Uh, I've offered some of those things here. Um, you get the, the major donors, $250 or more, get recognition on the wall. We get these plexiglass stars that stick on the wall in the, in the lobby. Um, but those are the categories, and some people like to do that. Uh, just let's say they have a family member that's always come to the planetarium uh, and, and is you know, they want to dedicate that a star to them or something. Uh, so the Friends organization not only is just a, a support network that is continuous, but whenever there's some project or something that's big, uh, we just upgraded to Digistar 6 and we had went on a massive fundraiser and the Friends started it, the dominoes rolling the right way. Uh, we had almost $10,000 raised from our Friends group then there was a Friends of the Nature Center. We're, we're a school system planetarium located in a county park, and it's a nature center. And so we have this cooperation with the county. So we asked the Friends of the Nature Center if they would contribute, because the planetarium has contributed to the popularity of the na nature center. And they did, and they pitched in $11,000. So right off the bat, we had more than $20,000 to go to the school board and say, the community is is really backing us up on this project. So little by little, uh, as we used the Friends Network as a, 
as a starting point maybe, some of the uh, businesses in town, uh, we wrote letters out to major businesses, to banks, and uh, this is the type of thing I, I'm not really used to doing. Uh, there are professional fundraisers and people that do this all the time, but uh, we had a, f a fellow who um, does kind of some minor f uh, fundraising for park projects or church projects, and uh, not the person who builds stadiums or you know many multi-millions, but someone who gathers uh, twenty or thirty thousand dollars to do a project in town. And he had enough connections for us that we could send out letters to these people, and we gained about another, I would say, ten or twelve thousand uh, just by asking, sending out a letter and asking. So um, as a typical way to bring in money to the planetarium and just on a regular support basis, I wrote a couple of things down. I would recommend trying as many things as you can in a number of dis different areas. Like we've tried and you see what sticks in your city. Um, our community, we're fortunate, supports us through our public programs. We um, charge $5 a person to come in to the public shows. Uh, and uh, school group programs, we charge $3 a, a student. So it is a discounted fee for school groups. And we get a lot of out of town school groups as long as you tell the teachers exactly what grade level, uh, what curriculum ties you have, why it's important to come to this program to help your science uh, projects. We have a gift shop, which doesn't yield a lot of money, but you know how it is if you sell t-shirts and you sell some things, you can add, get a few thousand dollars a year in your budget for, for just having a gift shop. Uh, you can do a gift shop online, too. Some of the schools do that. Um, sometimes we'll write grants. Uh, there are, there's a Waukesha Education Foundation in our town, and if you have a reasonable project, let's say we wanted to get One World, One Sky, like Sarah got, uh, we could, we could uh, write up a grant for that, and, uh, and they would give us a few thousand toward it, uh, if not the whole thing. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, we generate income mostly from education, from out-of-town school groups, and from the public, but uh, we've tried a lot of creative things as well. We do weddings. We've had six weddings in the planetarium. Uh, we do birthday parties, uh, scout groups, uh, earning uh, merit badges. Uh, we do quite a few of those, uh, so it's important to get uh, to know your local scout organizations um, because that's a big deal in, in, uh, in our town, and it works very well for us. Uh, a lot of the daycares like coming, um, so they're always looking for field trips, and they've got students that are four years old that love to, to get out, and you can get on the floor with them and, and get to know your, your students and then show them uh, let them get in the big chairs and see what's in the sky. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun for us as well. So the types of things I hear here, I'd like to try in our place too. So I'm always just adding more things and trying more things. And again, seeing, seeing what sticks and, and using it. So, okay, uh, let's, I don't know if I have another slide here. Okay, uh, pizza night. Uh, roller skating. These are other things we've just tried uh, advertising some of the schools. We can contact other school districts and tell them what we have. We just have a donation box sitting outside and um, we have special events in the park where it's, it's sometimes nice just to do an event and uh, gather people for that. Uh, okay, and I think I've mentioned uh, most of the other things here. Sometimes just having that you know, <laughs> fundraising goal in the hallway and a donation box there, uh, people think, oh, you know, you're raising money for this project. And so I use that uh, thermometer thing quite often in the, in the hallway. So, okay, back to you, Renee. Well, actually, I just wanted now to open it up to all of you. So I was just curious if you are doing events like this in your planetarium, uh, what has worked for you? Or if, it, or if you have specific challenges, you know, uh, if the, you think that, um, what, what would stop you from being able to do these sorts of events? Or if you, I know I've done events that have totally failed. <laughs> um, and so not, it doesn't always work, but then, um, like Dave said, you can sort of just try it and, and see what works. So anyway, uh, has any, anyone have any questions or any events that you have tried and found successful? 
Uh, so one of the events that we do at the Science Center that is wildly successful is uh, the World Space Party. Uh, and we celebrate Yuri Gagarin's first space light. Uh, it, it's basically like an after dark, a, a giant party at the Science Center, but it has been very, very successful. Um, and it brings a lot of people in. So if anyone wants to sort of monopolize on that, it's a good idea. So do you do music? What do you do in your world space party that, that uh, brings people in? Well, we, we started it by partnering with uh, Artex. And uh, an artist came in and installed uh, projection mapping on our uh, space shuttle and all of that stuff. Uh, and so we've actually partnered with him every single time now, uh, although now we have to pay him. He was uh, a grant before. But uh, he, he does all that projection mapping and everything on the, the stuff that we have. And we do planetarium shows uh, and just fun hands-on activities throughout the museum. I think the first year, because it was, it was free to the public, uh, we had 1,500 people uh, through that evening. I think it was like four hours, it was crazy. Uh, and then uh, after that, we started charging for it, but we've had uh, almost 1,000 people uh, the, the next couple of times we did it. Awesome. Uh, this is a question for Renee. Right, okay. Um, sort of a challenge that I face at my museum, since I have sort of a similar setup to you, especially technology-wise, is um, financially kind of all of our revenue goes into our overall budget for the museum. So I don't know what challenges you faced and if that was similar to what your situation is. It is somewhat similar to my situation. Uh, so some of the income that I make from events does go specifically back, back to the planetarium budget. And it's, I mean, we're all one museum, we're all one vote, and so if I try to remember that. Uh, it is nice to, ha one of the reasons I do do all of these events is because um, if you just looked at our budget sheet, the planetarium costs the museum money, right? Uh, I don't make enough because our shows are included with admission to the museum. So my budget sheet that I see doesn't include admission dollars. However, people can come to as many planetarium shows as they'd like during the day, and that takes a lot of staff time uh, to do. So that's why we do all these special events, so that if there's ever a question from the board or from our, our leadership, um, that I can show, you know, this is how much money just the planetarium brought in, just purely the planetarium events brought in, uh, run by planetarium staff. And, and it doesn't equal out uh, the planetarium staff members, which, by the way, I should say we all also do other educational programming at the museum. There's no one who works in our planetarium who is 100% time in the planetarium, uh, including myself. Uh, so uh, the so those events, the, most of the events do go straight back into the planetarium budget, uh, with the exception of the rentals, and uh, which is why I said they make the museum money. And that always bothered me a little bit because especially the ones that are in the planetarium, uh, they they always require planetarium time. They And, uh, you know, we're taking the chairs in and putting the chairs uh, out again. Um, but it, I keep track of how many hours the planetarium staff spends on those sorts of events so that then if there is, a, a, you know, again, a question of you're costing us money and um, it's just another way to help justify why we need three staff members and, and uh, how we're helping the museum um, by keeping track of that sort of thing. Uh, I'll take a question real quick, but before I, before I do, I just wanted to mention that uh, it turns out when we were putting this panel together, we found out that we were all doing a Valentine's Day under the stars, and I wanted to ask if anyone else is. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful fit, and I just wanted to say that we started it because of Bob Bonnador, who just walked in, and he will gladly share all of his jokes with you that he does during his program. <laughs> so please ask Bob Bonnador. What was your question? Right here. I was interested in your comments about uh, sponsoring seats. Um, what determines the price of the seat, uh, and are the sponsorships permanent? Do you remove them after a few years and start again to get another round of revenue? You can. Uh, when we did the research to, to look this up, we found that the Griffith, the Griffith Observatory did turn around every five years and offer people to buy their seats back, but they renamed the seats every five years. I also found out that they were one of the only ones that I saw do that. Most people 
uh, do have a permanent, you rent the seat permanently, and if you get new seats or you want to do that campaign, they take the, uh, the engravings off the seats and put them on some sort of plaque on the wall to say, here are people that have supported us in the past and, and we're, we're renaming the seats. Uh, what, what, uh, what determines the cost? In our case, we had another campaign to, we have, a, we have a zoo at our place and you could sponsor the animals. And so we, uh, we just based it on that model as far as what people were, uh, we use that research to say this is the price point that we're going to use. But every place is unique and it's, it's really up to you. So, yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, a question on utilization of your money. Uh, do any of you have issues with restricted and unrestricted use of the revenue? As in, um, Sarah, I think specifically with you in a college setting, is that revenue available for any use, or are there restrictions that the college puts on you as to what you're able to purchase and, and do with that money? Um, I think, in general, it's actually pretty open. Um, I can spend it on what I think is necessary. I have to justify it to my supervisor, but as long as I have a good argument for it, I have never come up against any um, conflict there. So. So far, so good. <laughs> I'll keep trying until I have problems. <laughs> Hello, Mel Blake from UNA, University of North Alabama. I wanted to say that I, I do a Valentine's Day thing too. And I always try to throw in somewhere during my star show, um, Alcor and Mizar, because they're a binary star. <laughs> So they're held together by mutual attraction. Uh, <laughs> Very nice. Day. It's corny, but it works. Um, and also coming up in a few weeks uh, for Halloween, I always I do my doomsday lecture where I tell people about all the things in the universe that could kill us at any moment. Because it's Halloween. And I decorate the planetarium. I dress up as the Grim Reaper. Um, I give away candy, because who doesn't like to give away candy? And uh, this year, for the first time, I'm going to do a little uh, Halloween because we do our programs on Tuesdays, and Tuesday happens to be Valentine's Day. Uh, we're going to do a costume contest where I give away uh, a little telescope as a prize for the best costume. So I've had really good response with that. Um, students in particular like to dress up all day on campus for Halloween. So. I have always wanted to do a show called Death and Destruction Under the Stars <laughs> because all of our special events are something something under the stars and now I never knew when I could do it. I'll do it for Halloween. Thank you so much. Yes, we're stealing that idea. Thank <laughs> you. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Ten I'm, ways I'm, to die in space. I'm kind of curious because we, you have a r nice panel in terms of the variety. You're a nice panel anyway. Well, the point you. is, <laughs> yeah, you. in terms of the variety and the types of planetariums you know, that, that you have, and so on, but there are a couple of things that I, that I want to note here. Uh, Renee, for instance, does about 50,000 people with a museum that does 180,000. So roughly, you're doing a capture rate of 28,000, uh, 28 percent of the of the total number of people. Some of you are nestled in a in a in a nature center, and the question is, is how many of the people who visit the nature area actually go to the planetarium? What is that percentage, and so on? And the reason why is that Anytime anyone does analysis on anything that's a for profit, is we talk about capture rate. It's the single most important thing we talk about. And it's the cheapest thing you can do to increase revenue because it's all internal advertising. You don't have to pay anybody else to do it, it's all done internally. In other words, is the ticket person pushing the planetarium? Is every curator who works in the museum pushing the planetarium? And there's a lot of things that you can do, including buying staff chocolates regularly and stuff like that. But the point of it is getting them into it, and it's one of the things that I think you need to start looking at your institutions from that point of view. How can I increase my, my participation and my earned revenue if I'm charging tickets for it? Now, those who aren't, change that. Because there's not a single place that, that gives away as part of a planetarium that doesn't lose respect. Because you're not earning any revenue. That's the way they look at it. Even though you're producing 50,000 tickets sales, you don't have any proof of how many people of the 180,000 went to your planetarium. Now, a lot of people did, but you have no proof of it. 
And so it's one of the things I always recommend people is to get out of that. <laughs> charge, even if it's a buck, charge. The other th psychology of it is, is that if people, if it's free, the psychology is that it must not be very good. Right, no value. And that is true in marketing. So it's one of the things that, that in, in how you can affect your earned revenue in moving up and forward, increase your, your, your participation, your, your capture rate, and to do those things. And I think that, that for the most part, all of you have done a really wonderful job in, in what you're doing uh, in this way. I, I think you may need to have some, you know, step back a little bit outside your institution and look at it from an earned revenue point of view. How many of you have gift shops? Oh, I think we all do. The best thing I ever saw to promote gift shops and sales was that the planetarium would always give away some free bag under the seat. It was done by a random number generator. And every planetarium show, somebody won something out of the gift shop. And you would be surprised what happens when that takes place. The child next to him says, but mommy, he won this little thing here. I want one of those. And what it does is it ends up generating a terrific amount of interest in your gift shop items. So give away a little bit and you gain a lot. It's a great marketing technique to increase your gift shop sales. And it's so fun too. I'd like to comment just on that quick. Um, I don't have a gift shop. I don't have room for a gift shop. I have no lobby. Um, but the idea came to me just as you were talking about that um, to do either athletic tickets um, for athletic events on campus or theater tickets or just a coupon or something for the bookstore. So for those of you who are in universities who might want to do that, you could, and you don't have a gift shop or can't have one, you could maybe connect with other places on campus that do things like that. It's also an opportunity to get rid of a lot of bad inventory. <laughs> it doesn't move very fast. Uh, if it's not moving very, it's a great way to get it to move, go ahead and put it in a free package, put it under somebody's seat, and say, oh, you're a winner. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great way of doing that. I'm gonna stop, who's next? Just uh, briefly, to, to take Phil's point a little bit further, your partnerships with the community bring people together, and that's what makes your planetarium popular. Whether it's a local astronomy club, make sure you get to know those people. You know, make sure the nearby planetariums, uh, getting to know your gift shop people, and uh, the partnerships that we have with our community have made our planetarium popular, and that brings people in. And they're the ones who back you and support you all along, especially when the budget gets rough. They'll come in and help. So yeah, that, that outreach, uh, those little outreaches are, are great ideas. Anyway. Yeah, I wanted to comment on free planetarium shows because our new CEO, when he came in about a year and a half ago, uh, found that the Pacific, I'm from the Pacific Science Center in Seattle, Washington. And when our CEO came in, we had a very poor reputation. We had a poor reputation for guest experience both from a quality of the experience and a friendliness of the experience. So our new CEO had a large initiative to change that, change that quickly. One of the things we had all over the uh, Science Center was ways to nickel and dime people to death. We had gravity wells that you could waste your quarters on, we had photo machines, we had all kinds of things all over the place. And we charged for a planetarium show. And he changed all that. We now have free ticketed planetarium shows. And it's improved the guest experience tremendously. The planetarium is, tra we encourage all of our guests to comment on social media about their experience. And the planetarium is, along with the butterflies, it's hard to compete with butterflies, <laughs> it really is. Uh, along with the butterfly house is one of the areas that is most often mentioned by our guests that it makes the experience at the Science Center worthwhile. And then our development office uses the planetarium for evening events to host donor events. So there is a way to have free public planetarium shows while still preserving the reputation of the planetarium, if you know what I mean. So it's not an always kind of a case. Yeah. 
Not quite sure if that's but I had a question for those who do Valentine shows. What type of programming do you put up? Are you telling star stories? What, for all of you who do that, I'm curious what kind of programming you're actually doing. Um, I, I do a, romantic constellation stories uh, for the first half of the show, and then I use our Fly Through the Universe software, which we have as Uniview. And, um, that's just, you know, it's beautiful so and, and live and stunning, so I just uh, phrase it as, I'll take your breath away on it with a tour through the universe. <laughs> we, we do something very, I'm sorry. We do something very similar. Um, uh, <laughs> and um, actually, one of my physics students, I was blown away because last year he came up with this line, and we do the, the tour through the out into the very reaches of our visible universe. And he said, you know, now you're feeling a little bit insignificant, but if you look to the person you're sitting next to or that you came in with, you are the world to them. Aww. And I was like, holy crap, where did that come from? Oh, that's nice. <laughs> the most awkward kid you've ever met. It was awesome. Uh, we, I just want to throw in that we actually make, made it originally an R-rated show. We had 18, peop 18 and up come to the show. And we would uh, we would tell racy stories originally, <laughs> do a little of that, so, and so also stories. yes, yeah. <laughs> lots of Zeus. Lots of, um, <laughs> but one of the other things is you also have the opportunity to interact with the audience and say say you know tell me a story how you met you know and, and ask them let them take up a little bit of the show too. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Keith. Yes. Hey, I've got a question for Dave. Yep. Uh, how did you develop the relationship with? Because I've been to your place, but. How does that relationship work with the county or city and the school district? And do they both fund you? And if they do, how did you get all that going? In, in one minute or less, please. Yeah, I'll try to make it brief. Uh, I had been doing planetarium programs in the basement of a, a office building for our school district for uh, 20 plus years. And uh, these public programs, uh, people come to all of, some people come to all the shows, you know how it is, you get repeat customers. And there was a fella and his daughter just kept coming and they really enjoyed it. And he said once, are you ever gonna remodel here or anything, did you ever any, have any ideas? I said, oh, I'd love to, but I haven't you know, uh, talked to the school system about it. And he said, well, they're putting a, an addition on Retzer Nature Center, the park out in the county, I'll ask them. Turns out he was uh, one of the big cheeses in our county government, uh, just one notch under the county executive. And because I had been doing shows that he really liked, he asked about the program, he talked to some people, and it got going, and pretty soon uh, enough people got involved in the idea that, hey, let's build the, planet, the new planetarium out at the na Nature Center where they're already doing an expansion. And so it was just that connection to a fellow that came to our public shows continually. It's, it's amazing how something like that. So we ended up having a cooperation with the county. It's a school system planetarium uh, located in a county park. So the county is proud to have this cooperation with the school system. The school system is proud to have this cooperation with the county. So it makes all of them look good that their two government agencies are cooperating. So it gives security to the planetarium in a way that you know has nothing to do with me. But the programs, you know, it, it adds a little more responsibility to us. We have to be good to please more people. But uh, that's how it all started. The county actually owns the building, so they maintain the roof and the building and managerial uh, custodial services. The school district owns the planetarium, pays the staff and support, and decides the programming. So uh, we have a county scheduling system. It's a large scheduling system that schedules golf courses and, and campgrounds and, and planetarium shows and a number of other things. So we're, we're part of their infrastructure and the school system pays the county to be part of their infrastructure. So uh, that fee comes out every year, I think it's $20,000 or something like that, to be part of their, so we do get their maintenance services, we get to use their secretarial staffs, we use their programming uh, uh, scheduling system. So yeah, it's truly a co cooperation that works, it's an amazing, 
thing. And now they've done that with the county recycling department. Uh, so they're, they're, these cooperations are catching on within city governments. So it's amazing how that, that just snowballs. Hi, uh, I'm Greg Merrick. I'm with the Harry Bailey Observatory in Bridgetown, Barbados, and we're hoping to build a planetarium next year. My question is, uh, I wanted to drill down on the uh, programming on these Under the Stars events. Um, <clears throat> I, these events, are they typically running for two to three hours in an evening? Or? They're two hour events. They're two hours, okay. So. Do you provide programming for the entire two hours, or do you do like an intro and then you leave them with some, some music for a little bit and then you do some more programming? How does that work? Uh, so the format that we do is uh, we let people arrive for the first 15 minutes or so. They're just arriving and getting their, um, okay. It's a two hour event. You get three drinks uh, per ticket uh, and food and drink, or, and then the food is included with your ticket price. And so when people arrive, we direct them to the, where, the, the, where the beer or the wine is. We tell them, you know, get your, get your first drink and get some food and find a seat. Um, since we do have the removable seats, we put out little tray tables so that people can um, have a place to set their food. Um, and then I, I let people know what the format of the night will be so they don't get um, nervous or not know what to expect. Uh, we do a, a tw 15 to 20 minute star talk using our star ball. Then we do a break and then people can get another glass of wine, another uh, little bit of cheese. And then we do one of our short full dome shows. So one of our like 20 minute full dome shows. Um, and then, uh, and we just switch those out uh, with whatever we have in our library that um, we think people will be interested in, or if there's been anything in the news about exoplanets or black holes or something like that, we'll, we'll do those. Then we do a, a last break where people can get their last drink, and then we'll usually have some sort of dessert out at that time. Um, and then we end the evening with about a 30 minute um, tour of the universe, or uh, we try to keep those uh, live but it's so it's almost all live except for that little part in the middle that is a full dome show. But we try to keep the Uniview tours really current. So um, I, I change the theme every single time, and which is why we get repeat people coming. And I base it on whatever's been in the news. So if Juno has been just taking some great pictures of Jupiter, I'll do Juno. Or uh, Cassini at Saturn. Or Gravitational Waves, I'll talk about black holes. So. Um, that's, that's the format of the event. We, sh we show off all the different types of programming we can do in the planetarium. All right. Oh. Hi, Mike Murray from uh, the Delta College Planetarium in Bay City, Michigan. Uh, we have a, a couple of things that are probably a little bit unique. It may not apply to very many places. One is our planetarium just happens to be located next to the big park that has the 4th of July fireworks every year. And so we do a 4th of July fireworks fundraiser because we'll have you know food and snacks and a special show. And then we take everybody up onto the rooftop deck observatory so they can have chairs and popcorn and watch the fireworks that are going off almost right next door. And that's always been really great because people want to be able to get close because we have the parking lot that we can close off and let them all get in there nice and close for parking. And it's a great way to raise money. A lot of them, even though they just come for the fireworks, they know that they're still supporting the planetarium. So that one's kind of fun. Uh, another thing that we have that might be a little bit unusual is our entire lobby has this stonework floor. And when they were building the place, they carved the constellations as disks all over the entire floor. And each disk, which there, of course, there's different sizes to correspond to the different magnitudes of stars, can be engraved. And so people can buy a star to have engraved to whatever they want on the floor. And the different size stars range anywhere from $1,500 for the smallest stars all the way up to, I think it's 3,000 for the, of course, brightest magnitude stars. And those are, of course, already taken. But the advantage to that is that it helped us to get our endowment started. And we draw uh, some money out of our endowment. It's not a lot every year, but it's enough to pay for one or two shows. And so that's enough to kind of get it started. We'd like to be able to kind of restart uh, that uh, campaign to, to get the stars going again. And finally, one of the th big elements that we look for for raising money is making sure that we make really close friendships and relationships with our development and marketing people. The college has an outstanding uh, foundation and development. 
and I try to get extremely close with them because I go out and look for various companies that might be a good match to sponsors either a show or some kind of an exhibit or an outreach program. And so it, that's been really successful because they see, oh, okay, well, we haven't already tapped them. They want to make sure that you're coordinating with them. But if you've done a little bit of research to begin with, then they're a lot more uh, amenable to wanting to work with you and may even include you when you go out to do the ask. And so that's been extremely helpful. Also, civic organizations, I've had, uh, you know, the Lions Club, the Kiwanis, those kinds of things that have funded yeah, a big. number of our programs. Yeah. Uh, not programs, but actually like displays and demonstrations, anywhere from Van de Graaff generators to spectrum tubes to liquid nitrogen uh, uh, to, to displays or, or d demonstrations that we do. So lots of things there that can help generate some extra money because the community is involved and they get to go out and promote what good they've done for you too. So just a few ideas. That's right. Those service organizations, the Eagles Club, the Lions, the Elks, they are, that's what their purpose is, to serve the community. And they're, they're willing to, you know, to, to, to donate. And so go speak at a, a women's club or a Lake Country a ski club or anything you can find in town and build up those relationships with your town. Uh, the Elks Club has been very good for us. So. Uh, I did walk in a few minutes late, but I haven't heard much mentioned about music shows, um, like laser shows, and I feel like, I mean, if we're talking about revenue generation, let's be honest. Um, how many, I'm just curious, how many people do music shows or laser shows or anything like that of some form? Does anyone do also like live music as events? Okay, of course you do. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, just curious, it's been a huge success for us, so I just was wondering how many people are still, are still doing that. I think we didn't specifically talk about laser shows because we figured that was one of the most common. <laughs> and, sorry, go ahead. I think, uh, I mean, I've done a few live music shows, just not very often in my plan term. I'm hoping to expand more of that, um, getting some of our um, students and faculty in to do things like that. Yeah, I'd um, like to too. But I've had mixed results with laser shows, so I'm not sure. At first, when we started them, I thought yeah. they were going to be the big um, money maker, but they haven't been as successful, and I'm not really sure why. So um, I know that last year I made the mistake of planning it over um, St. Patrick's Day weekend. <laughs> People were busy doing other things. So. Yeah, we've had. Uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, we've had we've had laser shows. Uh, we started. We now have the most success with running uh, Pink Floyd show just once or twice a year, um, and doing a lot of promotion for that. That seems to work better than having them all of the time. Uh, as far as live bands go, we've had everything under the sun. We've had packed crowds, and we've also had ones where the band's mom, uh, the moms were the only people that came to the show. So that's tough too. You really have to <laughs> research, do some research before you just have uh, bands in the audience. But yeah, there's a lot of I think we've all tried, everybody's tried something like that, right? What were you gonna say? Uh, yeah, there was a, we had some unexpected uh, positive income generator. Uh, when the Hidden Figures uh, movie came out, we did a, a, a free showing of it, along with a panel talk, sort of like your, uh, your cinema signs, uh, except we gave away free tickets to everybody. And we had 250 free tickets that were given out, a lot of people accepted them, and had only about 60 people show up in the end. Uh, the following one we did, the, which was the Voyager, uh, Voyager 1 and 2 movie that just came out, maybe a, a month or so ago. The farthest? Yeah, the farthest, that's what it was. Uh, we did that and charged, I think, $5 for it and had a bunch of people show up. Awesome. So, yeah, yeah the, the whole giving something out for free thing we found was just not, not right. Because we didn't even really care about the income, it was filling the seats that mattered. Right. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for coming and participating in our panel discussion. Our contact information is up on the slide, so if you have any questions, please feel free to come up and talk to us here at the conference or send us an email or give us a call. Thank you. Thank you.